Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know everyone has a busy schedule, but um, I think that you'll find the information in this webinar to be pretty useful for your businesses. Um, the title of the webinar today is Marketing Aging Care Services, How to Reach More for Less. And this is part two of a six-part series. You can see the full series on our website, corecubed.com. Um, under the About Us section and then click Events. So if you want to see what's coming up um, in the future, you can check out the schedule there. And you can also access recordings of the previous um, series if you missed any. Today everyone is put on mute mode. That is just to ensure that everyone can hear um, nicely in case anybody joins us late. However, if you do have any questions, during the webinar, please type them into the question, the little chat box, and we will answer your questions uh, at the end of the webinar, or if we miss you, we'll answer you by email. My name is Marissa Snook. I am the most program administrator for Core Cubed. I have been working with home care marketing um, closely with Marilee Orsini since 2005. And I work directly with our most clients, which is a home care hospice, and Medicare marketing program. Marilee Orsini is also going to be a, a featured speaker today. Marilee has, uh, she's sort of a home care guru. <laughs> she's been working with home care uh, back since 1981 when hardly anybody even knew what home care was. She started her own business, so uh, she was in the trenches. And she ran it successfully for many years before she sold that business off and has been marketing for home care and aging care industry since then and runs the Core Cubed business. So you can see there some more of her qualifications. So without further ado, I'm going to let Mary Lee Orsini take it away. Thanks, Marissa. And um, I, I don't know if Marissa mentioned, I don't remember it, but she's also been working directly with our home care clients uh, since 2005. So that's a lot of years of experience in the aging care industry. And we do um, have a variety of aging care service providers. And what we're finding is that marketing into this specific target is really um, is different than traditional marketing. So that's the reason for this series. And our objectives today are really to help you understand the current trends in marketing as they relate to the changing demographics. Uh, we'd also like for you to understand the method that most people turn to now for information to make decisions, and that is the business website. And we are hoping that you will embrace the concept of that as an important marketing focus. And then the third part of this is really to, because of the way that the trends of marketing are changing, a lot of the things are really more time intensive rather than money intensive. So what we're talking about today is also to examine the best way that you can spend time that's going to bring the most results. So really the um, doing more for less money. So we hope to accomplish that. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is a brief recap of the first webinar in this series. And again, as Marissa said, the entire series is posted on our corecubed.com about us. Um, it's the about events section. So you can always go there and listen to webinars that we have done in the past. But on the first webinar, we really talked about the target. And the most important thing about the target is who makes the decisions. And there are, uh, we went over the two different targets. You really have the frail elderly. That would be people who have frailties and need services that allow them either to remain at home or to, um, to age better if they have a frailty or a chronic condition or a comorbidity or in the case of hospice to, um, to, to end their life with a quality of life. So uh, the decision makers in the frail elderly component are normally the oldest daughter or if the, there's the, the daughter, um, there are multiple daughters, it would be the one who assumes the caregiving role. So it's really normally not the frail elderly person himself or herself. The other wonderful decision-making group that is a more business-to-business -business group is the group of trusted advisors. That would be, it varies, but this is just a short list, 
attorneys, bankers, trust officers, anybody that works with the, uh, either the frail elderly population or serves as an advisor. So that could also, again, the list is pretty exhaustive, but it could also be clergy or, um, or, or neighbors or friends um, who have experienced similar situations. And are these people, this is an important component, these people for the frail elderly making these decisions, are they local to their parents or are they long distance? Um, as you can see, you've got a lot of long distance scenario here um, because a lot of people providing care to someone frail and elderly is going to be someone who's living at a distance from home. And the active elderly is a whole another story. That's going to be the active person, him or herself, or someone that uh, is important to that person. But but it's it really is two totally separate markets. So that was really the most important takeaway from our first webinar in this series. And then the, the second part that we talked about in the first webinar was how do people get their information about products or services? And it really is uh, mobile devices and the internet. So you've got two ways that people are primarily uh, finding information and it uh, that continues to grow. Um, for a while it, that growth was a bit stagnant but as the um, as the years go on and as technology improves and becomes a little idiot proof almost um, we're seeing more and more people going to the internet and their mobile devices to to find research information. So um, this is a very important statistic and this is almost a year old now and I'm anxious to always see when these statistics go up but you now have over half of American adults over age 65 using the internet or the email and this is really the first time that half of the seniors are going online. And Marissa you have a personal uh, story to relate about this. Yes, absolutely. Um my father is a baby boomer, and he is, uh, considers himself computer illiterate. And I'm sure there are more than a few of people who didn't grow up in the computer age that would consider themselves computer illiterate. So I asked him, I said, you know, if you were looking for care for yourself or grandma, uh, would you, where would you turn to first? And it shocked me to hear that he would without a doubt turn to the internet and that was nothing that I I you know coaxed him for that was just his response so to me I think you know this to that backs up the statistics obviously the statistics shout it loud and clear but even people who don't consider themselves computer illiterate would turn to the internet for care questions and finding solutions and that is a pretty important component and the other thing is social media um, you know, a few years ago we didn't even have any social media. Now we, social media certainly takes up a lot of people's time <laughs> at work and, uh, and in your personal lives. And it's also working for older people. So more and more older people are turning to the Internet. I actually had a young person the other day say to me, oh, Facebook's for old people. So I thought that was, a, was an interesting take on, uh, on social media from a younger person. But it is certainly becoming something that is used more. And this is really the bedrock, though. This is um, maybe surprising to you all, but again, this is a recap figure. But but email is really the bedrock of online communication for seniors now. And, um, and again, it's, they're using it every day, and uh, it really is a way that, uh, to make information, to spread information around, to take things and information and share resources, and, and email is a very important component, as are mobile devices. More and more, as the mobile devices get smarter and easier to use and as the price points come down, you have more and more people using them. For each of these series, I'm going to just do a real quick recap of basic marketing strategy because what we find is that marketing is almost um, elusive or voodoo to some people. They don't really understand 
about marketing strategy and it is crucial that you understand and that's why we went over the targets. You have to understand is your target in aging care services, is it going to be the frail elderly and again we talked about who's making the decisions for that and if it's the active elderly then there's the, that's a different target. And you have to know your message, what message is going to resonate with that specific target. I'll give you a quick example. A lot of people target uh, for in-home care services are targeting in the second person to the frail elderly person themselves, and that's really not the target. So the message really needs to be to the person making the decision maker. And as important as the message is the visual, is does the visual marry with the message so that someone is reading it or hearing it also gets a very important visual component that's backing up and reinforcing uh, that yes this is aimed at me I'm the target and that message is resonating with me and that visual is reinforcing that and then the channel how it's delivered a way to reach the decision makers that's the other thing and as you've seen from the statistics there are some pretty clear statistics about how to reach decision makers. So another recap of this, so when you come and watch this again to reinforce your understanding of marketing aging care services, you will understand this is really the basic marketing strategy. Um, and this is reaching seniors, but it's also any other group, but we are specifically talking about aging care today. So when you look at marketing possibilities, this is, these are not all the marketing possibilities. There are certain more, more possibilities, but this is really just a recap of the, the possibilities. Now, obviously some of these are more expensive than others, and some of them are going to, when you make a decision about these marketing possibilities, you have to take into consideration a lot of things, how much they cost, who the target is, all the things we talked about in the basic marketing strategy. But as you can see, it's really not easy to take these and hone them down and try to figure out which one is going to work as you're trying to sell your aging care services because you have a lot of options to choose from. So what we thought we'd do today is really show you what are the current trends in marketing. Um, paid advertising, actually people are are not spending as much on paid advertising. The um, and, and we'll talk about why that is a little later, but these are really just trends. Uh, people are not using directories and phone books. As, as Marissa said, uh, her father, who considers himself computer illiterate, is going online, and as you saw from the statistics, well over 50% of people are, are searching for information um, and not going to that phone book. Actually, most people now don't even keep phone books around the house because they have their smartphones and they have ways to find information and on a smartphone as you know I'm assuming you know that when you look up something on a smartphone if that website is mobile enabled then all you have to do is push the phone number and the call goes directly through so it's a much easier process to find and get information and even connect directly to a product or service there's less push marketing going on, and by that I mean things that get pushed into your face. There are some exceptions to that, but for the, uh, for the most part, uh, there is less push marketing going on. Much more social media, social interacting, social networking, usage of uh, information that gets shared and gets reinforced and gets reviewed. and it, uh, So we're really seeing more social media across the board for products and services. And the other thing that we're seeing more of is content marketing. And by that we mean that it's not just sales information because you've got the capacity given the new technology to actually explain, show, diagram, give examples, show testimonials from real people. The content marketing is really something that because of technology is, um, is happening with leaps and bounds. And then inbound marketing, meaning People who are searching for products and services are going to go find that information and they are going to ask for information so you're not pushing the marketing to them. They're finding you and asking for the information. And then this last pick, uh, point here, the more visual marketing. Visual marketing um, is really having um, a comeuppance right now and I, I predict 
that you will see more trends in visual marketing because, I mean, a picture is literally worth a thousand words. And remember, though, marrying that picture with your message and understanding how it resonates with your target, those are really the most, uh, most important things right now to catch someone's attention. The statistics that you see on this slide really um, are about business to business, and these statistics are how marketers are now using information for their clients. So this, this is the popularity of these kinds of marketing channels. So social media is the most widely used now for marketers uh, when they're selling business to business. And articles on the business website is the second most. And then e-newsletters, still a very powerful component in terms of getting information out, specifically business to business. Blogs, case studies, you can see the rest of these. I mean, and what's common about these is most of these have to do with content marketing, except for the in-person events and the webinars and the webcasts. The most, most of the rest of these really do have to do with giving people content that makes, um, that will help them make a decision when they're looking for a product or service or when they're actually trying to understand um, what a product or service is and how it relates to them and if it's applicable. Um, and by tactic, social media, this is just a graph of what I showed you um, in written bullet form a minute ago, but um, social media is basically the most popular content marketing status. And, and this year it's knocked articles out of the number one spot. So social media is gaining in popularity. I predict it will continue to gain in popularity, and there's several reasons for that. Um, but all of the tactics that are content marketing tactics those have all risen across the board. The print magazine use is the, the only one that has remained the same at 31%. Um, this goes so hand in hand with content marketing. And what's happening is consumers want to be told a story. Marissa, you uh, watched the Super Bowl this week, didn't you? Yes, yes. And, you know, while watching that, it really reinforced um, watching those ads, you know, a lot of people watch the Super Bowl for the ads, uh, me included, and a lot of those ads, if you noticed, told stories. Certainly the best ones did. One that really stuck out for me was the uh, Dodge Trucks. It was Paul speaking um, over some images of farmers, and it was all about farmers, and it wasn't until the very end that you saw the Dodge Truck. You know, by the end of that commercial, you had a tear in your eye. You were emotionally affected. You were, you will not forget that commercial. You will not forget the Dodge truck. So it was a great way of indirectly telling a story that related to the Dodge truck, but was more relatable to a wider audience. And several of those commercials did tell stories. And it was interesting, the, the one that was voted the most popular was the Budweiser story with the, with the horse, how the, the man raised the horse, and then later on the horse came back to, to show his love and, um, and hadn't forgotten him. A real, almost a tearjerker, but, um, but a very memorable, memorable uh, commercial. So um, advertisements should tell a unique story. Uh, not just try to sell. And this is from the Adobe Systems. Uh, they did a survey where they were really went out to customers to find out what works in advertising and in messaging. So these are really the, uh, you can see the examples here. I'm not going to go over all of them because you've had time to look at this slide, but the most important component about this is telling a story. So let me let me just back this up with content marketing, visual marketing, what we've talked about. And of course, what we're trying to talk to you about is more for less. And if we're talking about Super Bowl commercials, we are certainly not talking about more for less because, as you know, those are very, very expensive um, advertisings to, to create and to, and to post. But there are certainly other ways that you can tell stories and that you can show people how something works. Um, one of the important things here, you'll see number three, product reviews. Product reviews are something that is really becoming more and more useful. I mean, 
many people now, if you travel, you can go online and find out what are the users of the hotels finding out. You know, what are they saying about their experience at the hotel? But the same is really true in aging care services because there are a lot of product review sites sites that didn't used to have product review, service reviews, and they are now. So um, it is actually a marketing tactic that people are using more and more to try to get their clients to post positive reviews um, so that people can see when they go to use a service or to buy a product, what have the users said in the past, and, and is, it, um, is it something that they would want to experience. So um, this should not surprise people though, the in-store experiences trump online experiences. Uh, that's one of the things research shows is that people do find out information online, do their research online, but then um, I'm going to extrapolate this to not only they go into the store to actually you know touch and feel the product but they also uh, this would relate to if you have a service for someone then calls you on the phone to follow up and find out more about it that is your in-store experience if you are a service provider um, so consumers do want to be told a story and and on a budget you can actually uh, tell a story uh, it is possible we, we will talk about that a little more and that gets us to what is the number one most important marketing asset that you have today as a business. This should be no surprise to you, but, but it really truly is the business website. And why is it your most important marketing asset? Well, if you take what I said about how people get information and what they're looking for and, and how they um, are using the technology to find information, the business website is a replacement, an alternative for the yellow pages. It actually is a replacement alternative for the dictionary, the atlas, the encyclopedia. So people are really online looking for information, trying to find problems, try, I mean trying to solve problems, trying to find solutions, looking for resources. It is literally a starting point on research for healthcare and resources and that is proven statistically. Um, it's also a resource for finding and pricing items to purchase and it is a very interactive and engaging tool when a website is designed correctly and it does remain a repository for important information. So it is such a crucial component um, in marketing. I can't even think of an analogy from past marketing because there has never been anything like this where you really do have the opportunity to present so much information in an organized fashion and help people solve problems and capture their interest and, and turn them into customers. Um, we've never had an opportunity like this um, and the thing that makes it even better is that it is a fluid medium. It is constantly changing. There are always upgrades and updates and, um, and positive things that are happening. There are also negative things that happen on the internet and, um, and that is one of the, the evils, but um, it seems to me that even though uh, there is evil that happens out there, by far the good outweighs the evil because it is, it is so important and growing so rapidly. It's also interactive. It is intuitively interactive. So it is really the best global medium for dialogue. Now that broadband usage is becoming more common, and I think broadband is in most of the United States now, it is fast. I, I do remember the days when it took forever to bring a website up, and now we get frustrated if it takes more than two or three seconds. These are the important points, though, with the website, in addition to being a repository for information. It is available 24-7. Think about those decision makers who are not in a location with the people for whom they're searching for services. Um, it is available 24-7. Someone can access it at their leisure whenever they want to, and it, uh, it means the business is open 24-7. The other thing is if you have a small company, a startup company, or if you have a single niche market product, it levels the playing field. It is very hard to tell on the internet um, if, if someone is a large company or a small company. And actually I will say that many of the larger companies, it's changing somewhat, but, but many of the larger companies um, have less effective and functioning websites than the smaller companies because they're using traditional marketing tactics and they haven't really understood 
the trends for marketing now and how those are changing and how they might affect them. So the global and reach and the open 24-7 are really the two most important assets that you need to think about for the for the internet and um, and that is why the business website is really so crucially important. And so what works best is integrated best with the website. So all of the things we talked about that are the important things, the important marketing tactics that, uh, that people are interested in finding information about or interested in reading or interested in, in hearing the story, those integrate very well with the website. So all of the things that we talked about um, are ways to draw people to the website, to keep them to the website, to educate them while they're on the website, and, um, and also for them to be able to download and for you to be able to capture information about them should you want to do that um, in the download. We have a philosophy of not asking for contact information a lot of the time because we strongly believe in inbound marketing and if we are presenting something or our clients we're, we're creating something for our clients that is going to solve a problem or help someone make a decision then we feel those people will then pick up the phone and make that phone call or or email or send an inquiry or make a referral but um, but all of these things integrate even webinars and, and webcasts um, those can be as we do house them on, on the website so we're not only reaching you today we're also reaching people who might have missed the webinar or come back later or who want to find out information and are searching for it so um, the website really is a, the perfect integration tool and why do we say that who is online is really the target now we talked about this a little bit before but um, you're looking at family caregivers searching for information online again this is statistic a couple of years old but I guarantee you when it's uh, updated it will increase as um, as well and again back to what the Pew study said in 2012 you really have an incredible number of people online searching for information reading their emails and um, and this last bullet is crucial. Once online, most seniors make internet use a regular part of their lives. They integrate it into their lives. And that's where you want to be if you're trying to reach that target. So let's talk a little bit about how to do more with less, which is really one of the things that we think you would love to hear and that we hope you will learn from today. And we're saying, if you have a plan, now the hour a week for best results is um, m means that you have to start with a plan. And we have really gotten it down to, to say because of the content marketing and because of the social media, it is possible to spend as little as an hour a week for best results. But starting with the plan is crucial. Now the plan is not going to happen in that hour a week, but if you do have a plan, and again go back to what I talked about with basic marketing strategy, you know who your targets are, you understand what the message is, you understand how to marry that visual with the message, and you're trying to reach the decision makers. So you look for a way to use the same information in many ways. Uh, actually part of marketing is really repeating that same information in a variety of ways and so whatever you are selling, if you're selling into the healthy aging market or the frail elderly market, there is information that people are looking for to try to make decisions. So you, you try to find that information and you look for lots of different ways to use that. And then we've talked about identifying your your targets. So if you can focus your targets where you have your best chance of success um, and measure for results is the last bullet here. If you're measuring where you're getting your results with which targets you can over time determine what is your best chance of success. So again maybe you're only spending an hour a week but if you are paying attention to what's working and doing more of what's working then you will end up spending less time with better results and then trying different messages. On the internet is a fabulous place to see what messages work, work best. You know, we don't recommend pay-per-click. It's something, pay-per-click is a way to advertise things on the, on the web that you pay uh, per 
click when a person comes through. But the one place that using pay-per-click works amazingly is when you are trying to see what messages work best. You can try for very inexpensive uh, trial method, you can take messages and see what works best. And if you use pay-per-click, then you're going to know immediately which of those messages are resonating with people, and, and then you can make some decisions about simple messages. So that's a very quick way. Um, the other thing is taking a look at the competition. If you're going to spend an hour a week for best results, you should spend 10 or 15 minutes of that hour at some point a month looking at the competition. So you can see what they're doing because uh, they may be doing something awful, but they may have some fabulous ideas that, um, that you might want to try and see if they work best for you. Um, and the other thing that will make it much easier for you to get be better results is to keep your branding consistent. First off, you have to have good branding, and that's a whole different um, workshop and webinar, but you have to have good branding and if you and you must keep that branding consistent. People must become familiar with you, your business, what it looks like. So and then the measure for results is really one of the most important thing and, and that's uh, having a plan and measuring for results uh, in this list are the most important to allow you to spend less money and spend less time in getting better results. Those are really the, really the two things. Marissa, you know, I, um, I'd like you to just talk about our most program here because that was really this whole uh, bulleted list here is why we developed that most program for the home care businesses. Do you want to talk about that just a minute? As Mary Lee said, you know, a lot of the reason why we developed the MOST program was because of these uh, bullet points. So, and for agencies that didn't have a lot of time, wanted to do that content marketing, uh, but maybe didn't have the time or didn't have the expertise or wanted uh, their sales team and development team to be spending time out on the streets um, or doing closing sales rather than doing the content marketing. So. Most was born out of that, and it was specifically designed as a marketing program for home care, home health care, and hospice agencies. However, there are so many materials in the most library that would work for many different aging care services, um, specifically if you're dealing with frail elderly. Assisted living facilities um, would be a, a good candidate as well. And um, it contains materials from educational standpoints. So you're telling your story uh, by giving uh, something relatable to a wider audience, things such as fall prevention, how to care for your heart. But then your messaging is on those materials, just like the Dodge truck was at the end of that uh, Super Bowl commercial. So people remember you but they, um, instead of tossing it away as just a sales message, these are uh, stories or information that is relatable to that wider audience and they pay attention to you. And we definitely have proof in using that program that you do not have to spend a lot of time in marketing to get good results. So, so how do you choose what to do for your marketing? Well, number one is going to be your budget. Um, you should set a budget. Uh, one of the things that we find most people don't realize that marketing is an ongoing business expense. It's not a one-time uh, event. It is really uh, something that you have to do repeatedly. So you need to set a budget and then you're going to want to work within that budget. The other important thing to understand is on your staff, what expertise do you have? Do you have someone who likes to write? Do you have someone who has a specific interest in, um, in something that relates to your product or service? So that's really crucial is identifying someone because if you have someone who likes to write, for instance, then they can write a blog. Um, particularly if they understand your product or service and have been with you for a while, they can write a blog in 30 minutes or an hour. If you have someone that doesn't, they're going to struggle with it like a term paper and it's going to take them forever. But So go within your staff and, and really try to find who, um, what, what expertise do they have. And the other thing is if you have younger people on staff, I hate that sounded like an ageist uh, comment, but oftentimes younger people um, are 
involved in social media and will understand how it works better than someone who is trying to get their arms around it and try to figure out um, how to use it. So you can cut a lot of time down by by really searching for someone in-house that might, that might be able to help you. Um, and obviously outsource if, uh, if, if you don't have any expertise in-house. But the other is time. Um, oftentimes in a home care agency, uh, because I ran one for, for 18 years, the um, there were you know, there's just not any time in the day, or they didn't feel like there was any time in the day. So you also have to be really realistic about how much time you actually have and who in your staff might have more time than someone else and marry that with, with their expertise. Um, then looking at the competition, what are they doing? Um, it's interesting because a very large company who has a huge marketing budget is going to spend a lot of money in marketing and we're seeing that now with some of the larger national companies who are getting into home care um, and who are getting into uh, residential facilities and, and different services for the frail elderly. Um, so in looking at the competition and seeing what they're doing, you do not want to pit yourself against someone who's got that kind of a marketing budget, nose to nose. What you want to do is find ways that you can have a compelling message that's delivered to those decision makers in an affordable way. Um, method and that's why we talk about inbound marketing and agency website and some of the the things that are affordable for for less money for a smaller company to do but you want to look at the competition um, and just uh, to get ideas for one thing but on the, the second level is to make certain that that what you're doing you're not going head to head against some of the big guys um, and you want to know your referral base. This is crucial. And we find this is such a simple process that we find most people do not do. Where are you currently getting your referrals? Um, and if you don't track that, track it. If you're, if uh, wherever they come from, whether it's online or whether it is by telephone or whether they walk in the store, but just asking the simple question, where did you hear about us? And I will suggest that you ask that question twice because we had a situation the other day where someone sent out information and got a good return from that information. The question they forgot to ask was, yes, they had a good response from the direct mailing that they did, but guess what those people did before they picked up that phone? They went to the website. So you really want to know where are those referrals coming from. And um, the other thing is you might have a set number of referrals that are giving you an inordinate amount of referrals, and it's really good to know that from a marketing standpoint. The, the other is your client base. Are there commonalities amongst your client base? Geographic commonalities, um, psychodemographic commonalities, and, and look for those because that's going to help you know who to target and what messages are going to resonate with more of like people who have already purchased your products and services. And then obviously looking at your services and products to, to find out are you offering what people want to purchase? Um, are there impediments to purchasing the products or services? Or are there problems with them? So make certain that you really do have good products and services to sell. Um, it's, those are, are pretty important when you're trying to decide what to do for marketing efforts. Well first I'm going to talk about a minimum effort scenario and then I'm going to talk about a maximum effort scenario. The minimum scenario is if you really have a small amount of time you need to figure out a niche or a specialty because if you have you're servicing lots of different people, you need to focus that. You need to focus on a niche or specialty. I have a, um, a story I love to tell about we're in, in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. Marissa happens to be in Chicago. But the um, we have a, a local hospital system here that's now changed its name. But it, years ago it was um, it was called Jewish Hospital and it was really number one in heart care, not only here in Louisville, but around the world. I think we did the first heart transplant, and there was a lot of communication about that niche or specialty. And at that time, there was a marketing survey that was done to uh, the community to find out, so who are the best hospitals in our our region and they asked for specific things. Who's the best in heart? Well, of course, Jewish came up. Well, one of the questions was who's the best in um, in obstetrics? And uh, Jewish Hospital also came up. Well, the odd thing about that is they didn't even have an obstetrics unit. So what what had happened though is 
people associated the fact that they had communicated this niche and specialty so strongly that they associated it across lines. So, um, so a lot of people are afraid to, to go with a niche, but what happens is if you're really good and strong in that niche, then people will appreciate that and understand that, and that translates into, into other services. Um, your website. This is a must. I've said your website's your most important marketing asset, and crucial to that is making certain that it is updated, that you have your current service offerings there, and that you have current staffing information in there, who's the management team, um, and also using your website for recruitment. That is another way to save a lot of time and money within your business, is if you're hiring new staff or trying to, uh, to screen new staff, to use the website as the, the first line there. Um, a blog, writing about your specialty. The, we're not talking much about search engine optimization here, but, but it is crucial to have your website found and having a good interesting blog and where you're answering questions and engaging people uh, is a minimum effort scenario that works really well, particularly if you have someone on staff who is a good writer. That's really sort of crucial for a blog. Um, simply collecting email addresses as a normal event of marketing and of networking and of relationship building is something that we also find that people are not doing. And you've seen how important an e-newsletter is to constituents. It doesn't take a lot of time and energy um, to collect email addresses. You might want to outsource the creation of that e-newsletter because that does take a lot of time, but collecting those email addresses is going to be crucial. And then sending that to everyone who actually has made an inquiry or interacted with you or that you've met anywhere. So uh, crucial and, and works very well in a minimum effort scenario. You need a lead generation strategy. You need to, again, understand who it is you're trying to market to. That goes back to what I said about understanding your clients and your referral base, and that needs to be religiously followed and measured and also um, and managed. So the other thing that we find this inquiry intake and follow-up process uh, it doesn't take a lot of time or energy to really make that an excellent process. And again, if you see how people are using information, where they're getting information, and the fact that they're going to call and have some interaction with you, oftentimes a business will get, uh, we just had a scenario today we are talking about, um, a lot of inquiries and referrals coming through that website but not turning into clients. And what that tells us is that when they actually make that phone call, to that business, something is happening uh, that is that is turning off people, and they're either not taking an appropriate inquiry or they're not following up as they said that they they would do when they take that inquiry. So here's maximum effort scenario. If if money were not an object, and if you would like to really get the the most uh, results from your marketing. You would need to do a marketing plan that would include all of your targets and on a monthly basis update that so that you are very clear about who those targets are and you're targeting them specifically. Expanding your sales and lead generation plan to have a list of your A, a people, which is going to be the people that are currently referring to you. Your B people are those who uh, either have referred once or maybe have a good potential to refer. Your C are those people who you would love to refer to you but have never and may not know you from a hot rock. So um, focusing your efforts on the A list primarily, your B list secondarily, and if there's any time doing other types of um, more push marketing to that C list, that's going to work best for you. So basically having the daily, weekly, monthly, and annual tactics, and then making certain you're using a monthly dashboard to measure where are your sales and, uh, and your leads coming from. So, um, and educating, educating about products and services, and looking for those referral sources who have the potential to refer to you and giving them a value added. We're talking about content marketing, we're talking about relationship building, we're talking about value added services. So those educational offerings can spread a wider net and because they're you are actually giving them something of value that in, in the referral source's mind is going to be something that uh, they will think of you when a care need arises or when they have someone who might want to use your product or services. Um, making certain that you're, you have at least monthly updates to the website for 
a variety of information um, and engaging in social media daily. That's a much better result. Daily engagement is a far better result on social media than sporadic engagement. And then the other part of this is actually integrating all of the efforts and the best place to integrate those is going to be, guess what, on the agency website. So the take-home messages from today in marketing aging care services. Number one, you simply must have a plan. Number two, you must take the time to create that plan, decide on who your targets are, and what specialties you offer that sell the best. So you're going to sell into that. Number three, be realistic about your resources and your staffing. Um, and I should add in there your budget so that you are being realistic about what you've got the time, the energy, the capacity to do. And then this use engagement thinking in all your marketing efforts. Um, engagement thinking, what I mean about that is I mentioned taking information and using it in many ways, but also trying to engage those decision makers in discussions with you um, and interacting with you so that the you're not just thinking about selling services or products you're thinking about engaging people in conversations telling stories um, one of the other things if you'll notice that happened on the Super Bowl commercials this year was that the audience got to choose the end of some of the commercials and that is engagement thinking. It's trying to get people hooked and engaged and interacting with you because if you think about how people buy products and services, they're going to buy from someone they know and someone they trust. And so engaging in someone is the first step in relationship building. So that is a thought process that the internet really makes possible and that is something that uh, that you need to learn how to integrate into your marketing efforts. So in achieving more results for less, and we will answer questions in a minute, I've talked about making a realistic plan, working it, and budgeting for it, taking a hard look at your business website. Um, and actually it would be good to have someone else look at the business website for navigation, for ease of use, for visuals, for information, and make certain that that website is meeting the needs of your business because again, it is your most important marketing asset. As, um, asset. And then outsource where it makes sense. I mean, what you're looking for is let's work smarter not harder, and that way you will actually achieve more results for less money. I'm going to real quickly cover the other presentations in the series. Um, this is on our CoreCube website, but also we have four more presentations. If you've missed the first one, you can go listen to that one. Today's the second one. We will be posting that in a couple of hours, and then we have these other ones, and these are available for uh, people to go ahead and sign up for on the CoreCubed website if you are so inclined. And I'm going to go to questions and answers next. And for the questions and answers, um, you can put them in, as Marissa said, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, I do have a question about social media that says, in regards to social media, what are the main things for a medium-sized home care company to be doing, and that's in quotes, with their Facebook site? Well, first let me mention that um, marketing is not a one-size-fits-all uh, project. So a medium-sized home care company to me doesn't tell me what kind of home care you have. Are you a Medicare certified agency? Are you Medicaid? Are you private pay? And also uh, who your targets are and what services you provide. So um, so for for Facebook, Facebook, the, the really main reason for Facebook is to try to get people to um, be familiar with you and to um, to engage with you. So what you're also trying to do with Facebook is increase your engagement because that's a positive for search engine optimization. So the ranking of your website is more and more going to be related to engagement and that's engagement in social media and also engagement on your blog. So, um, so what you're really trying to do is engage people. Um, I would suggest that you, again, we, we mentioned taking content and trying to use it in different ways. Uh, try to find visuals that are going to fit with the branding of your company and with the message that you're trying to, uh, to give out to people. And don't just repeat um, 
resource links that everyone else is repeating. So uh, you really have to use Facebook to develop a personality. I would actually suggest that you think about if your agency were a person, who would that person be? Uh, would they be irreverent? Would they be funny? Would they be serious? Would they be old? Would they be young? Would they be helpful? You know, come up with a personality and, and try to take that personality and think about what would that personality be saying if that person were um, a personality. Whoops, sorry. Apologize for that. Um, let me. I have more questions here. Let me see if I can if I can get to some more questions. Um, how can I get my targets, doctors, to opt into my email campaigns? You know, doctors are a hard market, and um, and my suggestion is that if you want to target doctors, that you really do some research into where those doctors are spending their volunteer time. Um, a lot of times you'll have um, doctor's balls or you'll have specific doctors if they're in chronic care will be associated with other, uh, with disease associations. Um, I would really look and see where they're spending their their volunteer time and I would try to spend my time there as well. And while you're there, uh, meet the doctors, start building relationships with the doctors, and um, and then talk to them. The other thing about your email campaigns is your email campaigns have to be interesting and they have to be relevant and they have to be value added. So many businesses do emails, uh, their email campaigns are self-centered and selling, so they're not giving anything to the person reading them. All they're doing is selling services. So um, you really have to make certain that, that your emails are of interest first. And then secondly, uh, you have to build that relationship with the doctor so that, A, you're giving them information that they would like to receive, and secondly, you are interfacing with them in another way so that you're building those relationships in a personal way. Marissa, do you have anything that, um, anything that you'd like to add to that? Um. No, I think that, you know, everything that you said right there is absolutely correct about um, making sure that your communication is value added. Um, it's nice for people to hear about caregiver um, internal awards or things like that, but is that going to get them to read your newsletter again? Probably not. Um, the next question is any stats on smartphone usage in the 65 plus market? Yes. Um, 80, 69 percent of adults age 65 and older report that they have a mobile phone. That's up from 57 percent in uh, 2010. And even among those currently age 76 and older, 56 percent report owning a cell phone of some kind, and that's up from 47% in the generation in 2010. So I don't have specifics about smartphones, but I do have cellular phones, and I'm pretty certain that, um, the, that the smartphone market is continuing to grow because um, we're seeing more and more people actually using smartphones to get information. So um, that is the end of my questions. If anyone else has a question. Then let me go through and make certain that, um, again, the slides will be available at uh, corecubed.com right slash about right slash events. So if you go to the about section on our Core Cubed website, you will see uh, a link to the events and you can go there. And, and we have not only this series, but lots of other webinars. We've been doing them for years, so we have lots of them there. But in this particular series, we do have a lot. And let me just make certain nothing else has come in for us. And I would like to thank everyone for attending today. And, um, oh, here's one. I keep getting approached by texting companies, but I feel it's not a good fit. Is anyone using that? Um, you know, I don't think texting is a good fit for aging care services, number one, because I don't think many older people text. It's just too hard to do. <laughs> 
and um, and one of the things that happens in aging is that you're you have less dexterity with your fingers. Um, so I'm I don't think for aging care services that uh, that texting would be a good fit. I think texting is a great uh, marketing channel to use if you were targeting younger people. Um, so, but I don't think it is good. I do not think that it is going to be good for um, for older people and targeting aging services. And that is the end of my questions. And we're about at the end of our webinar. So I'd like to thank you very, very much all for attending today. And um, we look forward to the possibility of working with you in the future and to your attending the rest of our webinars in this series. Marissa, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone who has attended today.